Welcome, everyone. It's Angelo Robles to the Angelo Robles podcast. I'm also the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. I'm really looking forward to today's interview. The legendary Stanford Business School course, Interpersonal Dynamics, Building Exceptional Relationships with Family, Friends, and Colleagues. It features one of those two iconic professors who also penned a great book that I loved, and that would be David Bradford. David, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Angelo. Well, I mean, other than perhaps investing, this is probably my favorite <laughs> subject because it's so much more like the words that you use in the course, interpersonal. And our world is changing What now with social media and apps and we had to be on Zoom like we are now and less face-to-face. -face. I'm wondering if our interpersonal skills are kind of going out the window, which well, is I why I wanted to have you on and there's so much to talk about. So David, why don't I start there? In an increasingly remote world, have people lost the ability to build exceptional relationships? I'm not sure they've lost the ability, but they certainly have lost the use of it. And I think Zoom is part of the problem. Uh, I have a colleague who said, um, the great advantage of Zoom is I can cut to the chase. But my question is, what is being cut out? And I think what is being cut out is the personal. So you think of what happens at the office or uh, happens when we meet friends, we schmooze for a while. We ask how they are. We ask about family or other events and we make a personal connection. And I think Zoom has driven us to be so task focused, which is important, but it's only half of the formula. And we need to bring back this more personal way to relate. We used to call that in business, the water cooler effect. It almost Absolutely. became a comedy to bring up that word, but we all knew what that meant. Now, there's two things I'm hearing in the world of business. One is people have adapted remotely better than the higher ups, the corporates, felt that they would. I guess that's a positive. I could also argue it gives the employee more freedom and time with their family. It gives them the opportunity of living more remotely and not being tied down to say a San Francisco and New York, just using that as an example. But it also gives the employer more freedoms of hiring around the world. However, I could imagine coming out of college and needing hands-on mentorship and training, that kind of went out the window. So I guess you could say there's good and bad relative to how things have progressed during COVID and now kind of transitioning post-COVID. I, I think that's true. And I think there's things we could do about it. So um, <clears throat> in Silicon Valley, there are executives who do the following thing. So they have a meeting of their executive team. It's all by Zoom. And they start the meeting with every member, including the leader, having 90 seconds to answer the question, if you knew me now, and they'd fill it in. If you knew me now, you know I'm excited about this product. If you knew me now, I'm worried because my son is sick. If you knew me now, you'd know that uh, I'm concerned because of this and that. And they find that when all the members do that, and it takes uh, 10 minutes at all, it starts to build back that cohesion, that water cooler effect that you talk about. And it takes just small things like that to have us again be more personal, which I think is we need that. And to give our audience a little bit of context, I mentioned the Stanford Business School course, Interpersonal Dynamics, and David and his partner, in terms of being a professor in that wonderful class, have been doing this combined for over 75 years. I think they know a thing or two. And it's usually the highest rated class at the university of Stanford. So that's really, given that such a prestigious university with amazing professors, that's really wonderful and a testament to your dedication and the work that you do. Uh, one of my earlier questions that I wanted to ask is going to seem a little bit out of left field, but it does all tie in. So I have a personal friend to give some context. I believe he's 31 and he's a dating coach. So I'm going to phrase a question kind of for him, because I think this goes heavily into interpersonal dynamics. The most common first dating option for those under 30 remains dating apps, Tinder, Bumble, whatever it may be. Not that I know too much about them, uh, which leads me to believe. So I asked him, 
how about people like 30 to 40? And he goes, no, it's up there, but it's not the number one. But for those younger, maybe outside of college, because you have the interaction in college, which is now very limited, although hopefully getting better. So my bigger question is, and he says this, so I'm going to repeat it. Do men, people fear rejection? And he gave an example. He has so-called manly men who fought in wars. They have less fear of doing that than they do approaching a stranger. Well, I, I think we're, we're all concerned about rejection. Um, I think one of the, <laughs> I'm not sure there's a lot, one of the advantages of being a man, I think, is I think we get rejected more often. I mean, we're the ones that initiate uh, that. So we, we become a little battle scarred maybe. Uh, I, th I think we still feel it. I know I feel it. Oh, I don't date, but uh, we get rejected in many ways. I still feel hurt with rejection, but I don't feel devastated. And um, but rejection does hurt because we wonder, is it me? Is there something core in me that the other person doesn't like rather than accepting the fact that not all people get, get along together? And that's as it is. A true, and not only that, in the example that I described, we don't know if that person has a committed relationship, is in a marriage, had got fired earlier that day and is in a bad mood no matter what. There's so many circumstances beyond our control with little information. We honestly go into that sort of interaction at best, at best maybe 50-50, depending on also <laughs> the schedule of that person. Uh, so I, I do find that interpersonal dynamic of two strangers, let's use that, in a completely non-social friendship circle or setting to be a unique case of why people fear something like rejection and interacting and sharing with people that they don't know. How does executive function play into our ability to communicate and build relationships? By executive function, uh, expand on that a little bit, Angelo, because that can mean many things. Well, I think there's several things that fall under executive function, uh, cognitive flexibility being one, but the main one relative to our conversation today, I'm going to lump in emotional intelligence, which is part of right. executive function. There's IQ and EQ, and I know people in the community don't like that verbiage EQ, they like to say completely emotional <laughs> intelligence, but maybe for the purposes of our dialogue to keep the acronyms a little more faster pace, we'll go with EQ for now. Uh, so is EQ, is EQ every bit as important, and in some fields or relationships more important than IQ? Well, for one thing, there, there probably isn't that much of a spread in IQ, so we have a statistical issue. But EQ certainly is crucial, and it's becoming increasingly uh, important because work is more uh, work is being less objective and more uh, personal. I mean, we do business with people, and we need to be able to build those ties relatively quickly. We need to be able to sense how they're feeling. We need to be able to express our emotions in an appropriate way. So more than ever before, EQ is really crucial. And uh, the question is, uh, how do you get that? Well, you beat me to my next question. How do we get it and how do we get better at it? Well, I think we get better at it the, uh, out of practice. Uh, I would like to think that our book, Connect, is uh, one of the best ways to, uh, to get at it because we talk about that. So uh, what I would say is if you want to increase your EQ, first of all, you need to be in touch with your feelings. And many people aren't in touch with their emotions. In fact, what we had to do with the book is we had to have an appendix which lists some 200 emotions that we often aren't fully aware of. So the first step is, do I know what I'm feeling? The second step is, am I willing to share that? I think another part is, can I sort of read between the lines or pick up non-verbally how you're feeling? And uh, I think that's how we start to make connections because feelings tell what's important to us. If I say I'm pleased or I'm upset uh, about the same event, that tells you a little bit more about David. In terms of, 
identifying where I am on the emotional intelligence side of things and looking to get better. I'm assuming, like you said, reading and certainly your great book would be a great start. Some people maybe are better learners by watching, I don't know, a YouTube video about interpersonal relationships, emotional intelligence. Uh, inevitably, to, I think, get better and better, like you said, requires to take action, experience. Would we also benefit from having a mentor who's really good at emotional intelligence that could give us guidance and help us get better faster? I, I, that, that always helps, coaches help, but I don't want us to rely too much on authorities because I think uh, we need to take the risks ourselves. So I, th I think there are two risks that deal with increasing emotional intelligence. One is taking the risk of showing more of myself, but the other risk is asking the other person. So the other person sort of frowns a little bit. Are we willing to say, Gee, Joe, you seem bothered. Did I do anything? And if we are open to hearing their reaction, we can start to calibrate our behavior. And that person may say, well, you know what? Uh, you kept on talking and didn't give me space to talk. And say, well, thank you. Now I've learned something. So I, th I think we learn from interaction. We make mistakes in our interaction, but can we see our mistakes as opportunities to learn? not as something to beat myself up about. There's a belief with IQ that we have relatively a limited bandwidth that we're born with. And although we may be able to optimize, uh, we're still gonna be to some degree within that bandwidth. Uh, with emotional intelligence, is it born, learned, environmental? And is there more of a bandwidth to quote unquote improve? Yes, I think there's a much uh, wider uh, bandwidth. I think there are some people who have a hard time learning. Uh, people who are highly narcissistic, can't hear feedback reactions from others, always have to present a perfect image and therefore can't learn. So there's some people who have difficulty learning, but I think uh, what we see is that people can learn. And the course that you talked about at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, I think teaches emotional intelligence. People uh, work on getting in touch with their feelings, work on expressing it work on hearing feedback, and we see dramatic improvement in a 10-week period. So I think uh, EQ is something we can learn if we're willing to take the risk of trying some new behavior and of hearing other people's reactions. Kind of a business-centric question, since you're in the heart of the iconic entrepreneurship, early stage, venture capital, We've seen entrepreneurs that maybe lack interpersonal relationships, but they're great creators. Uh, but can you grow a company as a builder without understanding interpersonal relationships? I'm assuming you could hire the right people uh, and it's way more than just HR, but people in more senior or C-level positions. It's hard to imagine being a great leader without having wonderful or growing into expanding your interpersonal relationship capabilities. I think you have to be exceptionally in technical ways to compensate for lack of that. You know, the iconic person who represents what you're talking about, Angelo, is, of course, Steve Jobs, who interpersonally was very, very difficult, but a brilliant man. And one wonders what Apple might have been even more if uh, Jobs would have had more interpersonal skills. And uh, what he had to do is he had to surround himself with some people who could be a buffer. Well, it's sort of sad if you have to have a buffer between you and the people in your organization. And I think also you can command obedience, but you can't command commitment. And I think that it's emotional intelligence that make people really want to follow you. Uh, now, they want to follow Jobs because he was so brilliant, but not all of us are as brilliant as Steve Jobs was. And so I think the more we can do to increase our interpersonal skills, the better we're going to be in building relationships and in being productive. I'm trying to think how I could phrase my next question. It's probably going to sound salesy and manipulative, <laughs> whether it's with people of the opposite sex that we're meeting or business relationships, but I'm going to try. In conversation, some of us in sales are taught to converse using what they call multiple different frames, and then to drop the ones that aren't working 
and to focus on those frames that you're trying to control. It sounds a little bit manipulative, but is there some degree of credence to someone who has to lead or begin the conversation, especially with a stranger, whether personal or business, that they need to carry on multiple different frames of a conversation and drop some and add to others? Does that make any sense? I, I think it does. Let me reframe it a little bit. It may then seem less manipulative. Uh, all of us have our own style, uh, our own way of interacting. And what we try to do when we interact with other people is to find out how the other person wants to interact. I think also what's important is too often when we meet somebody, often for the first time, is we focus too much on ourselves. And if we could focus on the other person, can we find out more about them? Can we be curious about them? And people like to talk about themselves. So I find it's relatively easy if I can find something, whether you call it a frame or not, that uh, they're interested in, that I'm interested in, and we can talk about. So I think if we can look at the other person and say, I really want to get to know you, to you, that's what we say to ourselves, then the questions start to come and the conversation starts to flow. I think a related follow-up to that, if we're mostly convincing, and I, that's probably the key word here, <laughs> if we're mostly convincing someone, strangers, loved ones, business relationships, colleagues, if so, have we made up our minds and are not open-minded? Is it important to always have a beginner's mindset? And is that part of being a good active listener? Absolutely, absolutely. And I always worry about convincing because that assumes I have the answer. And I think I really need to know the other person. I need to know what they want. And we know in sales that you first need to find out what the other person needs before you talk about your product. So I think if I go into a conversation with it all figured out, I'm not having a conversation. I'm having a one-way uh, uh, lecture. So um, I think the having a spirit of inquiry, of curiosity, of uh, this is an interesting person who has an interesting job. Can I find out more? Gets you a long way. I would say so. And going back to what we said earlier about emotional intelligence and how I guess I framed the last couple of questions, this is a skill that can be taught uh, from your book to your class. Again, I mentioned YouTube videos, mentorship, but you did say an important thing earlier and that basically is you can maybe read or learn so much. It's like playing baseball. You could read a book, you could watch a video, and I think those would be helpful, but what's the best way to learn how to fish, how to play baseball, how to drive? Inevitably, it's to go out and do it. So taking action, and learning from what's working, what's not working, and calibrating. Would you say that's the ultimate in terms of importance to putting it to practice? Absolutely. And I've had more than one executive I've coached who said, I've never made a mistake. I've only had learning opportunities. <laughs> and, and the trouble is when we make a quote a mistake, we beat ourselves up. But you know, we're all flawed individuals. And if we could see that as learning opportunities and just make sure we don't make the same mistake twice. Uh, that's how we grow, that's how we develop. And are we willing to take the risk of trying something new? And maybe it won't work, but maybe we can learn from it. And, and I, it, it, it is in the doing that we really learn. It's, and again, I'm sometimes in some of these having a hard time phrasing them. This goes back to me and my experiences with successful people in business. Not everyone is going to be a Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg and have a 150 plus IQ. Uh, but if they're curious, if they're incredibly disciplined, if they understand process to an outcome, is there a, is there a formula that puts them in a position to likely be more successful that is not based on skill, it simply is based on curiosity, discipline, and following formulas that have worked for others. Yeah, I, I think we need to hold the fact that at best, we only have half the information. And it's when you have executives who think, I know the answer, I have all the information that's in trouble. If I can hold that I only have half the information and you have important information, 
then that's going to drive me into curiosity. It's going to drive me also into collaboration because how could I put my information together with your information to come up with a better solution that helps both of us? Now, David, you're going to get the barrage of about five or eight questions that are known as <laughs> Angelo's crazy questions. Uh, here they come. Will decentralized power solve the problem of centralized power corrupting absolutely? Um, I'm going to frame that a little differently, but I think you're onto something very important. When there's a large power gap, between two people. We know there's a bunch of research that supports this. We know dysfunctional things happen. When there's a large power gap, the person with high power no longer listens to the low power person, no longer sees them as a human being and treats them as an object. The low power person withdraws, uh, holds back information or could even sabotage. So I think what's crucial is that we narrow the power gap. We don't remove the power gap. There's always gonna be power gaps, but we want to remove it so that the person who has less power feels free to speak up, to disagree, to say, now wait a minute, that may not be quite the right way to do it. And there are things that both parties can do to narrow that gap. And one of the dangerous things is the person, a low power person, low power position, does things that increase the gap by withdrawing, going quiet, being obsequious. So I think the more we can build organizations, build relationships, which have a narrow power gap, the happier both parties are gonna be. Yeah, that's a great answer. I mean, I remember back in my days in corporate America decades ago, they used to have the suggestion box where people <laughs> uh, from the CEO down to anyone, whatever, a dishwasher could contribute something, be anonymous, whether that's good or bad, but have their, their question or their voice heard. I guess we used to chuckle that like, was that such a great idea? It was probably onto something that we didn't follow up enough with. Right, right. So as I've got a little story to tell you is that um, my daughter uh, works at Western Washington University, went in the research lab, and a department chair was doing something uh, that was uh, causing some problems. And my, Kendra, my daughter, went in and um, told him what it was. And he thanked her. And then he said, uh, this must have been hard for you. And she said, no, it wasn't hard at all. You don't know my parents. And I felt very <laughs> proud about that. Because what she was able to do is not to be overawed by the status difference, by the degree difference, differences in degrees, but to see him as a human being and to realize that she had some crucial information that he needed for his sake as well as for hers and to be direct about it. And I, I think that um, we can do that. And, and the trouble with the suggestion boxes is also the joke that the wastebasket is right beneath the suggestion box and that's where all the suggestions go that we, we need relationships where i can without being abrasive without a career limiting move say to people with more power i think that's a mistake we need to talk about it and if we had organizations where people felt free to do that and where leaders made it easier to do that we'd have much more productive organizations the more successful we are, I guess, especially relatively early on in business and in life, probably the more we're susceptible to thinking that we're greater than we are and subject to biases like confirmation bias. Correct. Uh, how do we acknowledge that we're all, and Ray Dalio, who commented that your book is great, so that's like all the recommendation that I think anyone in my audience <laughs> should need. Uh, talks all the time about ego and blind spots, ego and blind spots. But when you're successful, like Jobs early in his career, and we could talk about how he was ousted and came back and all that, but how do we acknowledge ego and blind spots and go back to what I said earlier about having that beginner's mindset? Well, uh, I think you're absolutely right. And we have a lot of historic um, cases of people who made a brilliant decision and then got hooked on it. Uh, Henry Ford um, uh, built Ford Motor and then Answer and uh, General Motors passed him by. We have uh, 
uh, other sorts of examples. I think part of it is, uh, can we realize it? But more, can we surround ourselves with people who in a sense uh, will tell us the truth, uh, who in essence don't have to attack us, but can say, look, that was a great idea, Joe, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, you have um, all the answers. Now, a wonderful historic example, if I can give it, we tend to think of military leaders as having to act that they have the answer. And I was reading the book uh, 1776 about the American Revolution. And it turned out that George Washington, when he surrounded Boston, where the British were, decided that he wanted to attack them about five times he decided that. And he was talked out of it each time by his staff. And he realized afterwards, if he would have attacked he would have lost and we would have had a different government. So here was a great general who was human enough to build, to have a staff that could talk him out of something that he wanted to do. I didn't know that story. No, that's fantastic. Generally regarded by many as the greatest American president. Of course, that would be after that fact. So that says something about, again, ego, blind spots, and being open-minded, and anyone could have great ideas. Back a little bit to my crazy questions. Hopefully, they'll get a chuckle and an answer. Let's see. Good. Will psychedelics, David, free us from the brainwashing of the educational system? <laughs> I don't know. I'm uh, not into uh, drugs, um, and I would hate to have us rely on chemicals for something that we ought to do ourselves. But I think you're onto something about the educational system. Too often the educational system strives us to have the answer rather than getting us curious about the process of finding the answer. And um, I have to say as a uh, faculty person, one of the people who are most susceptible to this are faculty who think they have to have the answer. When I think the best teachers are those who also get into curiosity. So we need an educational system that encourages exploration, curiosity, inquiry, not am I the first one to be able to solve this problem? I've asked the next question in some form to some amazing people, some of them billionaires that went to MIT like Michael Saylor, and others like Adam Robinson, a ultra high IQ person. And that basically is what is the core value of college? We look at it from learning a skill, that's potentially one, to getting away from home and becoming independent, to interacting with people of different backgrounds and cultures. Those are probably the big three. But then I, I, I phrase it a little differently. Is the main value of college that we learn how to think for ourselves? Yes, yes. The ability to problem solve, to think, is crucial. In fact, I think there's more and more evidence that what college ought to do is not to give solutions, but to give problem solving skills. What I heard, and I think it's true, is that in a four year engineering degree, almost more than a quarter of what is taught in the first year is outdated by the time they graduate. So it's, it's not the facts, the knowledge that's important. It's, it's how do we problem solve? And, and that I think is the crucial skill. Now tied in with that is also a tolerance for ambiguity. And somebody once described brilliance as being able to tolerate ambiguity and then do something about it. So can we live with ambiguity? Because the world is complex. And still, when we have to, take the necessary action. I got different responses on, OK, if we agree that learning to think for ourselves is the most important, then in terms of how this occurs, is this from interacting with people and doing, taking action, experimenting, and learning? Or is this completely ingrained in our DNA and there's very little we could do about it. Oh, I don't think it's in our DNA. I, I think it's all learned behavior. And uh, I think also one of the problems is what is the mental model we hold of, of what is being competent? 
And if we hold uh, the mental model of being competent as having the answer, it gets us locked down. But if we can hold the mental model that being competent is being able to find the answer, that puts the emphasis on something different. And I think that's what can be learned. So I always like educational systems where you get graded on the process of how you of the answer as much as did you come up with the right numerical score? Yeah, that's a great example. A couple of weeks ago, we had on a very well-known podcaster, former hedge fund manager, and very active as an entrepreneur. His name is James Altashir. Uh, and he said, listen, I went to an Ivy League school in informational technology. I got out of school. The first job I got, they realized I was so bad that they had to send me effectively to a night school to get better at certain <laughs> specific skills. And he went to an Ivy League school, which yeah. goes to show that now, imagine today's world of finance, which is changing so rapidly. We have the rise of of digital and crypto and all that. What we're learning is becoming outdated sometimes, forget a year or four years later, sometimes weeks or months later. Yep. So learning how to adapt, I guess, and you said uh, tolerance for ambiguity. Uh, is this happening enough in colleges? And is this on the student, the parent or the teacher, a combination of everyone? I, I think it's, it's not happening enough. I think that, uh... Too often, um, a, a, being a faculty person, I'd like to put the blame somewhere else, but I think I want to own the blame. Too much of it is what we do. Uh, I remember having one colleague who said, uh, when I enter a classroom, I know exactly what I want to cover and I know exactly where I want it to end. Well, that's not much curiosity. That's not much ex exploration in that person's mind. Now, I. I want to come back to uh, what uh, our course uh, taught. I think that what we also need to learn is how much we need other people, not just socially and not just personally, but we need other people to solve the problems. Um, one of the things that I say to executives who think they have the answer, I say, well, you may know more than any one of your immediate direct reports, but you know more than all of them collectively. And if you do, you've hired the wrong people or you're kidding yourself. And I think that the job of uh, why we need strong relationships is we need disagreement. We need people to come in with different perspectives. We need to be challenged. And the question is, uh, can we learn how to do that? And can we see that as a sign of success, not as a sign that I have failed? How important, I guess related to that, how important is being an evangelist in interpersonal dynamics? Well, I worry about <laughs> being an evangelist because evangelists think they have the answer. <laughs> and I think everything we've just been talking about is be careful when you think you have the answer. Uh, I would like to think that, um, what is another word I can use? Uh, I would like to think that I'm a, um, a person who is committed to learning about interpersonal relationships and committed to helping other people learn about it. Uh, that's, that's where I think the world is going because we're becoming increasingly interdependent at work, uh, in the family. I think the old days when the male had all the answers is, is long gone. And uh, we need to be able to build relationships where we can tolerate and encourage different viewpoints. Well, I'm going to do a quote from Nelson Mandela, then try to phrase a question that is quasi respectful. We'll see. When a man <laughs> is not allowed to live the life he believes, he has no choice but to become an outlaw. Again, Nelson Mandela. You claim interpersonal dynamics describe the interaction among members in a specific social context. You also claim, if I read correctly, that each setting is different depending on the purpose of the group and the environment. Why isn't this just a bunch of ass kissing among snowflake participation trophy generation, as I would call it? And does this create kind of social outlaws manifesting in real time? 
Well, I think what Mandela is talking about is that when my voice is not heard, then I go underground and I sabotage uh, and I work outside the system. And that doesn't help. I think that's a better response than just going silent. But that's not the way we need to have organizations or societies work. Um, so what we're talking about is, is not uh, ass kissing or being obsequious. A key thing we talk about in the book is the value of conflict. And so often we see conflict as bad, but conflict is different viewpoints, different ways of coming at it. And one of the things that we know is that when leaders can encourage disagreement, quality solutions go up because um, in fact, there's one interesting research uh, study you may uh, be interested in. This was a, uh, actually a professor of mine who had groups of people solve a problem. He thanked them for it. And then he said, solve it again. And the second solution was statistically superior to the first. The first one is the top of the head solution. Well, if we build relationships where we can disagree, the second solution is likely to be better. And we need better solutions. If the environment and social context matters, then how do we know people are being genuine? And the probability is many of them are probably not. Well, I uh, say to our students who think very, very highly of themselves, I say, you think you have two real skills. One is you're good at conning others and you're good at seeing through when somebody cons you. And I say, you can't have it both ways. And I think that people are more skilled at seeing through uh, other people's uh, fake presentations than they are on spinning an image. I mean, Angela, think of the amount of time or amount of uh, times you have interacted with somebody and they're putting out an act and you say to yourself, God, that's transparent. And it usually is transparent. So if we think we can fool people, particularly over time, uh, we're, we're only fooling ourselves. A colleague of mine says, there's nothing more powerful than the truth. And there's nothing that saves time more than the truth. And I think that we need to be more truthful, more ourselves in our interactions. Yeah, that's a great saying. I'm going to remember that one. Uh, my next question I'm looking at, we kind of went into a little while ago, but it's going to, I'm going to phrase it a little differently. The educational system, the ecosystem is I could argue a brainwashing back to that word mechanism to actually keep to keep the masses from thinking for themselves. Yet isn't that the main value and goal of college? Uh, so this creates the challenge of a system looking to overcharge. Uh, and again, I'm a parent with a child going into college in a couple of months. It'll be a couple of hundred thousand over a four year period. And I, I do have to. I do wonder the, valid the validity from a skill perspective that he'll be learning and how outdated in the world of business and finance that may be in four years. Well, one of the interesting things, as I understand it at the School of Business at Stanford, is that we, uh, we get applicants who have uh, many undergraduate degrees. And we don't favor those with a business degree. We don't, we don't want that student. We want a student who has a liberal arts degree, who has an econ degree, who may have a political science degree, because we believe they have learned more how to think than they have just acquired a set of skills. So I don't know, uh, yes. I know when, when my son was uh, thinking of college, he was first thinking of engineering school. And I said, no, Jeff, I said, uh, get a liberal arts education. You can get an advanced degree, which you did do in a uh, in engineering uh, but learn how to think and so i would hope that your son and other people go to college would look for courses that make them think because that's what is going to be so crucial in fact i think in the um, 2008 uh, depression we had some people uh, actually 
progressed quite well during the bad economic times. And those were people not with advanced degrees only, but who could think. And that's what you want college to give you. Uh, hmm. What causes more evil, fear or greed? I remember there was a speaker when Martin Luther King gave his famous talk at the uh, Lincoln at the Lincoln Memorial, his famous speech. There was another speaker who said, the greatest sin is silence. And, and I think silence is what does us in. There's always gonna be greed. There's always gonna be people who think only for themselves. But it's when the rest of us go silent that we collude in letting that go. So um, I think the person who speaks out, uh, who goes against the tide, those are people that we need to encourage and we need to foster. Who wins in a fight, smart or crazy? <laughs> I think the, the smart person is the person who's able to turn a fight into a way that we can both win. See, I, I think that uh, there are many more win-win solutions than we think. And when we initially see it as a win-lose, maybe we've already lost. Can you define winning in one word? Winning is when both of us, as much as possible, get our goals met. And you see, that's gonna require that I understand you and understand what you need. And you need to understand me and what I need. And that means we need to be open about what we want. Those are the preconditions to us working together. It doesn't mean that I give you what you want. So I have to get what I would need, but can we, work this out? Can we disagree? Can we explore new options? I think that's, that's the person who is going to both win. What is your definition of a great teammate, coworker? Person I can trust to tell me the truth even if I initially don't want to hear it. A person who is um, concerned for me. And uh, again, I would say that uh, one of the things we teach in the course and in the book is to, um, we reuse the hallmark phrase and we say, I care enough to say the very worst. That is, I will tell you what I think you need to hear, not what you necessarily want to hear. I want colleagues like that. I want colleagues who are concerned for my growth and who say, David, you're doing something that's hurting yourself. And I care enough about you. I'm going to confront you on this. I want somebody who will go out of their way to help me as I want to go out of my way to help them. It's, it's a whole notion that I want one and one to equal three that what we do together is much better than either one of us could have done alone. David, what is your definition of being selfish? Well, that's actually more complicated, Angelo, than I think you may uh, mean. I think we first need to be concerned for taking care of ourselves. There was, the famous statement by Hillel, a religious leader, who said, if I'm not for myself, who will be? And then he said, if I'm only for myself, who am I? <laughs> if not now, when? And I think that we need to take care of ourselves, but we can't lose the fact that we also need to take care of others. So selfish is not abdicating is it, being not selfish is not abdicating my needs, but being selfish is abdicating my responsibility for your needs. 
how are you as a professor now again you're graded on like probably in high school by your students so that that helps but how are you held accountable for the theory that you are teaching and how is success or failure measured even from your perspective with your students well there's too much of a power gap even though i try and reduce it part of it is age part of it's education um so i the power how I'm held accountable is less by my students and more by others. The person who most holds me accountable is my wife. And if I do something that's not uh, more than it's not congruent with what I believe or write about, she'll sometimes say with exasperation, you write about this stuff. Why don't you do it? And that keeps me pretty straight. I'm doing that with colleagues, Carol Robin, who I wrote the book with. Uh, we're very honest with each other. And when we think that uh, the other person is not living by what we talk about, we say it. So I hopefully have surrounded myself with people. Uh, I may not want to hear it. <laughs> I, I may feel a little bit hurt at the moment. But boy, I'm grateful when I have people who, in a sense, um, keep, me, uh, keep me on track. Because it's asking too much of each individual to try to be perfect. Um, there was <laughs> another religious leader who said, um, our job is not to be perfect. There are enough angels in heaven. Our job is to be fully human. And part of my humanness is I make mistakes and I need to surround myself with people who will catch me when I forget to catch myself. Very well said. I'm gonna ask you an advice question from three different perspectives. We hinted at one already advice you would have for someone in high school transitioning, actually like my son, into college? Why don't we start there? Oh, I just be open to learning. Um, question, explore. Uh, it's a whole new world for you to discover and what you need to discover is how to discover. And just don't take answers that are given to you as the answer, but ask why. Let's jump ahead four years, transitioning from college into the so-called workforce. When you're hired for your first job or second job, Remember that you're hired for your potential. I think people get into trouble when they start a job and they think they have to show how smart they are or show they have the answer. I think what they need to show is how open they are to learning. Um, get a mentor, say, uh, what can you help me so that I make fewer mistakes? What do I need to learn? So again, it's being open to learning in a different way. It's, it's realizing that um, there are people there who've worked there for years who know a lot that maybe you need to learn from. Yes, that would definitely be true. And a little bit related to that, my third and final one from the advice perspective, uh, my core role at Family Office Association is working often with generational families that are successful. Many of them still have family businesses. Now we're talking about how about working as a family member inside a family business? And that gets very dicey. Would it be some advice from maybe both the elder generation and those that are rising and coming up that you would have? Yeah, I uh, actually taught a course on family business, so have uh, some interest in this. I think the core question with family business is, is the family working for the business or is the business working for the family? And when the business is for the family, then you hire your sister, whether she's competent or not. You don't discipline your son, even though he's screwing up. When and those tend to be businesses that don't last. Um, there's some interesting evidence that uh, it takes three generations to build and to destroy a business. Yes. And there's actually a phrase that you probably know in China, which says three generations, 
from uh, rice field to rice field. And it's the same thing. If the business, if the family is for the business, that is, they're dedicated to it, then you're not going to hire your sister if she's not competent. You're going to terminate your brother-in-law if he's not performing. You're going to hold them to the same, if not higher, standards because you're putting the business before the family. And that's very, very hard to do. And it might be that you won't put your son as your successor if he or your daughter, if he or she can't do it. That's what's hard in family businesses, is to put the business before the family. Relating to that for a successful families over generations is the importance of governance, basically how decisions are made. Often with the first generation of wealth, it's effectively a dictatorship. It's very easy and convenient and may actually be highly effective, but it probably doesn't pass through the generation so well. Talk a little bit about the importance of governance, how decisions are made, and the importance of mission and vision statements. I know I'm throwing a lot out there. No, that's fine. I teach the leadership course, so this is all relevant stuff. I think the first thing around governance is the question I have is, uh, who, what's the board? Is the board an independent board? That, or is this a hand-picked, uh, that's just gonna be an obsequious board? That's, that's crucial for governance. I think the other thing for governance is, um, with the founder is, is the founder uh, willing to let go? Or is this gonna be like um, Hamlet where the father's ghost is always around uh, around the walls and around the, uh, the, uh, the business. Uh, is that person going to tolerate a different leadership style? Remember that the founder was successful because what he or she did was fit their style. But we all have different styles. And if you impose that style on somebody for whom that isn't their natural inclination, you're going to be less effective. So it's a process also of letting go. And that's very, very hard for founders. Incredibly hard. And that maybe relates to my follow-up on what I stated. Uh, and it relates to what you said about three generations, the dictator model. I believe it's an odd number and it's less than three. That means it's one. Uh, <laughs> but how does that transition through the generations when all your family is going to know is that dictator model which is probably not going to fly with the younger generations. Uh, do they transition or do you transition as the wealth creator entrepreneur? I'm willing to give up control of the family business or even of a lot of our family capital and trust, whether through a family office structure or through multiple family members being involved. And what's the right decision in terms of how that mixes in with vision and mission of the family? Well, there's about three different questions there. That's yes. wonderfully complex. That's great. Uh, first of all, um, you need to, you have two systems. You have a business system and then you have a wealth management system and those could be separate. So you could have the family involved in how the money that's held in trust is uh, d dispersed, which is different than governing the business. So I would separate those two, those two systems. The other thing about learning different leadership models, what I've seen successful is when the children, their first job, their first real job is with another company. They go off and learn in another company before they come home. If they only go from college to the family business, they don't have the breadth of experience that they're gonna need. So that's the, that's the other thing. And, and um, I think that the third thing is that um, again, the family needs some way of honoring the founder and having the founder move on to something else. It's sort of like with, with the English, the king is dead, long live the king. We need to honor what the founder did, but not have that person be the role model or still be in control. And um, I know one of my colleagues who studies this says, uh, 
uh, founders work best when they when they die. Well, I hate to see that as a model of passing on. And is there some way that the family can say, you built this, you've done a wonderful job, it's time to move on, let go. And again, what we're talking about is confronting people, valuing conflict, valuing different approaches. You didn't bite on to my lead of the verbiage, mission and vision statements. Uh, Do you think those are overrated and how someone feels at the moment on paper or are they valuable, but how could they be done correctly? Yeah, that's, um, and we've done a lot of work on that. There's a whole difference between values that are really integrated versus those are a pro forma activity. I remember consulting a Fortune 500 company with the executive team and I was observing the executive team for a year and they had all of their values and vis uh, visions posted on the uh, wall in the, uh, in the meeting room. Not once in the year did they refer to it in their making decisions. So the question I have is, is it being used? So one of the stuff, one of the ways we have handled that in working with organizations is when the uh, executive team is developing that, we say, what in the past, what would we not have done given this value? Or in the present, what would we not do given this? We've got to ground this in specific actions. Then we take it a step further. We bring in the next two levels in the organization, break them into cross-functional teams. And the assignment for the team is to say, okay, you've heard the CEO give the vision and values. Now identify what are the behaviors that have supported this and what are the values, behaviors undermining. And they spell it out. And I remember one organization where the, the team said, you talk about being frugal and yet we have our own flight of planes. Why do we have them? You talk about us making quick decisions, but it takes four levels in the organizations of approval. Why are you doing it? And what, it, what they did is they grounded it in actions and the executive team had to listen to it and had to respond. They couldn't say, well, it's more comfortable for us when we have our own plane. They've got to say, this is the economic reason. This is how it fits it. So vision and values are real if they're used. Vision and values create cynicism when they're just pasted to the wall or on that little piece of plastic that people put in their shirt pocket. We often hear the verbiage in business and successful family businesses and families in general about the word culture, culture. Uh, what does that mean? You mentioned the word behaviors. I think it's less to do with what is written and more about the actual behaviors, but how would you define it and why is it important? Well, culture, uh, one of the things that we know is the formal rules it's not what governs an organization. Part of what governs it is the network of relationships. That's really crucial, we know that. And the more you can build strong relationships across the organization, the better the organization. But the other one is the informal rules. So uh, one of the wonderful questions to ask is to say, if somebody wants to look good in this organization, yeah, they gotta perform. What are the behaviors? What are the actions to look good? Uh, do you take the credit and pass the blame? Do you always leave work after your boss does? Do you, um, uh, in essence, um, hide your mistakes? What, what are the real rules? And that's the culture. And the culture are the informal expectations of what's appropriate and inappropriate behavior. And that's what governs so much. And, or, and CEOs need to look at what are those informal rules and uh, is that what they want to have govern their organization? Given my company is Family Office Association, and for those that are not as familiar, a family office is an entity created by one family of great wealth to internally and exclusively manage their finances and often other affairs. So among the world's richest families, billionaires would often have a family office. 
So they're going to hire talent, often non-family centric, to run the family office. Could I make the argument, David, that pure skill set, there's always someone better than someone I could find who's going to be most talented and outsource them. But if I'm going to insource someone more than their skill set, it's their interpersonal relationships, their capability of listening. And what's the word I'm looking for? Being creative, thinking out of the box, finding the person or people that could help me. But that capability of listening and making me feel good, quote unquote, may be more important than a pure skill set. If, if you want that, I'm worried. Because if you're hiring somebody to make you feel good, they may not tell you the truth. So the first question I would have is, what is it you want? Do you want somebody who is going to be most effective, who will tell you the truth, who will confront you when they think you're wrong? Or do you want somebody who just says yes? Now, in either case, wouldn't you answer that? I hope you answered the first way. What is crucial is, and there's not a better word for this, the chemistry between the two of you. How, how much trust can you build? How much openness can you build? Now, this why the word chemistry is wrong is, is it sounds like it's something magical. Those are characteristics that you can build. So I would want to not just look for somebody who gives me what I should get, but where we can build that relationship, where we can disagree, where uh, I know that you will tell me the truth, whether I want it or not. Um, and that is something that uh, the two of us can build. And I would want uh, that to be the, the major criteria of who, who we'd hire. We often see challenges in family offices where the founding generation, we hinted at some of this earlier, hire someone who's probably a contemporary of theirs, someone they trust and someone who's talented in their own way. But then the next generation of influence, the rising generation, doesn't feel like that person is in tune with them. Uh, and then that becomes a bit of a generational thing. You mentioned earlier with elders, we should be happy and learn from their experience. But sometimes with age and success, like we also hinted at earlier, you become closed-minded. So how do you balance that? And how do you realize that sometimes the leader of a family foundation or family office may need to evolve and be different for the younger generations? Well, uh, again, I'm, I'm making the distinction because you're using the words uh, concurrently. I think there's a difference between a family business and the family financial uh, organization. Those are two different social systems. And it may be that the founder is going to be the one in charge of the financial uh, uh, situation, the, the trust funds and stuff like that. Um, and and that's, that's, they may have their own purses they want. Uh, but that may be different than the person who runs, runs the business and uh, who is the COO in, in that business. I, I think when you, but in either case, the situation you're talking about with the younger generation, remember what you're talking about is a younger generation is saying, I'm not feeling fully heard. I'm not feeling that my needs are being taken account of. I think that person is listening to the founder and not to us as much. I think that's a situation that has to be talked about and dealt with and probably needs an organizational consultant to deal with. Because the question again is, how can different people's voices be heard and taken account of without one being the one who controls it all the time? And we're getting a question that came in. It's, it's actually a good one. I should have asked it earlier. I'm gonna slightly tweak it. David, how do we get people to like us? And then my little twist, is it more important for them to like us or respect us? Well, I'm gonna talk about two different roles. I'm talking about you as a leader and you as a person. And that question applies to both of them. Let's talk about a person. I think all of us wanna be liked. The danger is needing to be liked by everybody. 
if you're liked by everybody, you have given everybody control over you because you bend yourself into a pretzel to be liked. Um, I say, are there a half dozen, a dozen people who are really important in your life? And those are people that you need to be liked by. And other people would be nice to be liked by, but you're not upended if they don't like you. And there's many people who don't like me, but that, that's okay. It may be as much them as it is me. Now, in terms of leadership, when I teach the leadership course, I say, if you're a leader to be liked, you're in the wrong position. You're a leader to do what is necessary. And that often requires doing things that get you disliked. Can you live with that? So again, you're, you've talked several times about ego. Can I have enough security in myself? Can I get affirmed by the small group of people who are really important to me? That I can say to people in the organization as a leader, you may not like this. I've heard your position. I've taken into consideration, but we're going to do this. This is the way it's going to be. And can I live with that? And too many leaders say, this is the way it's going to be, if that's okay with you. And then all of a sudden, they become ineffectual. Excellent. David, I do want to be respectful of your time. This has been great. I really learned so much, and hopefully my audience did as well. For those that would like to learn more and purchase your book, the name of the book, and how could they do so? Amazon or how else? Amazon, other places, your local bookstores. Local bookstores need to be uh, supported. The book is called Connect, Building Exceptional Relationships with Family, Friends, and Colleagues by Bradford and Robin, published by Random House. Um, glad to say that it's in the second printing already after four months. And uh, 14 foreign publishers have bought the rights to translate it into foreign languages. So we think that this has uh, real popularity, not just popularity, but real value uh, worldwide. So we would urge you to do it. Look at our website, which is called connectandrelate.com. And you'll find some additional things to help you, including a self-assessment questionnaire. Uh, so um, we hope that you'll find it helpful. And David, the name of the course again, is it Interpersonal Dynamics at Stanford? interpersonal dynamics that the students call touchy-feely. <laughs> yes, they do. That's talked a little bit about on the website as well. So we highly encourage our audience to definitely go and buy the book. It's fantastic. And hopefully some of you are going to Stanford and could take the wonderful course. And David, again, it's been tremendous to have you on. In my little close, everyone, I'm Angelo Robles, host of the Angelo Robles podcast, the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. You can learn more about us, including our interview and videos, where some of them, including this one, will make its way to my YouTube platform, which simply is Family Office. You can find it. We're extremely active, actually, surprisingly, on Instagram. It's our company name, Family Office Association. And you can learn more about us at our core business, FamilyOfficeAssociation.com, as a membership organization and consultancy helping families create or reinvent their family office. And many of the topics that we spoke about today with David are incredibly important to much of that. So go and learn more. We hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, David, again, thank you so much for being a great guest. Glad to be here. Thank you, Angelo. Thank you. Bye-bye.